Hi, welcome to another edition of Sanage Report. My name is Ed Johnson, and uh, today we're going to check out the backyard of Bill Morgan, uh, otherwise known as the Geritol Gardener, who has transformed his uh, small urban backyard into a uh, amazing vegetable garden, which serves him and his wife 12 months out of the year. And he's grown some very unusual varieties and has quite a bit of knowledge uh, in in the gardening field. So. I've asked him a lot of questions, and uh, so I hope we both learn a lot from this experience. So follow me, and we'll go see what Bill is up to today. Hey, Bill. How are you? Good morning. You're Ed Johnson. That's me. Yeah. Welcome to our garden. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's have a look and see what you've been doing here. You see, this is just a normal lot that um, people would normally have a lawn here and then badminton set or something. Bill has turned this into uh, quite a um, quite a collection of vegetables, and let's go have a look and see what he's been doing here. It's, it's August right now, by the way, so it's right in the middle of harvest season. And I think we have raspberries yes. to look at. So let's go see what he's wonderful. Here. Okay, what kind of raspberries do we have here, Bill? This is a Tullamine red raspberry. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, probably the best raspberry, hardest to grow. Mm. Why is that? Because of the um, susceptibility to root rot. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a fungal disease of the, uh, of the uh, soil that kills the plant. Can you avoid that by not watering and keeping the ground dry? Uh, somewhat, but it's probably best to put them in raised beds up mm -hmm. at least a foot and a half to two feet. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also add a surface drain underneath which would help take the water away. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you uh, prune these or cut them down? What, what do you do well, the these are uh, just at the end of their uh, growing season now, so the, um, the old canes will come out and the new canes, which you can see here, the mixture's fruit. Mm -hmm. That will be tied up and uh, uh, the mixture's uh, crop. As you can see, they're, they're a huge raspberry, very large. Very sweet. And how, uh, so you've got what, uh, 12 feet? Here, this is about uh, 16 feet. 16, feet. 16, and it uh, it produces enough raspberries for us for winter usage mm -hmm. throughout the winter mm -hmm. and um, for neighbors and uh, people that uh, mm -hmm. like it, raspberries. Yeah, the advantage here, I guess you can pick them when they're exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. don't have to, uh, like commercial places, have to pick the whole thing at once. That's and right. You wind up with yeah. some yes. good and some not so good. I know that's the tr trouble with strawberries when you buy them. Exactly. Well, let's see what else you've got here. Uh, okay, this one here is the uh, red ra or uh, fall gold raspberry, mm -hmm. and it produces on new wood. Uh, fall, so it hasn't produced yet. No, as you can see up here, mm -hmm. the blossoms are just starting. Mm -hmm. And it'll produce in September, October. Mm -hmm. uh, a very nice berry. Mm -hmm. You can double crop it mm -hmm. by leaving it standing after its fruit, or you can cut it down and it'll fruit next year in the fall. Are they red or yellow? They're yellow, gold. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I have some information up there that I'll give you uh, regarding this berry. It's, uh, it's a very, very good berry. Mm -hmm. So this one's easier to grow than this one? Yes. Right? much and it's hardy to the prairies for uh, minus 40 degrees oh really yes so you can so you don't so what do you do at the end of the season do you cut it back I cut it back because we have the red raspberry here for the June July crop mm -hmm. yes okay okay let's go see what else you've got around there and see okay. some other berries over here okay uh, so uh, look at the size of these berries yes this is called a young berry uh, uh, not too well known, but developed uh, in Louisiana in 1905 by uh, B.M. Young, and uh, it was a, uh, a blackberry, uh, loganberry cross, yeah, and it's very almost ready to go. Yeah, right? it's it's ripe when it just falls in your hand. Yeah, huge, beautiful berry. Lovely taste. Yeah. Crossed with a dewberry. Mm. Dewberry cross. Mm. Loganberry. 
and this produces wind to wind. Like I see it's still flowering, so. Yes, this will produce from uh, oh, mid June to uh, late July, August, mm -hmm. early August. So it beats the blackberries. Well, the, 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 the reason I grow this in the Marion Berry is because they, they don't produce new growth, new plants from rhizomes underground. They produce new growth from tip rooting. So that way you eliminate a lot of your uh, um, new growth coming up all over your garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I see some uh, stretching out there, so what do you do with those? So those are put in the um, bed and, oh, yeah. and uh, uh, pegged down. That's your next year's growth. Mm -hmm. So they'll be left on the ground for the winter and uh, the tip will start new plants. Mm -hmm. So then you can give them away or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, then they're wound up onto the um, structure mm -hmm. uh, for, for fruiting season. Mm -hmm. Now you, speaking of the structure, you've got this netting here yeah. all over, uh, I guess for a good reason. Yes, uh, it keeps the birds out and the unwanted people that want to <laughs> eat all your berries. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why the shotgun's by the door? <laughs> right. <laughs> and down further, you'll see the, uh, one of the most popular berries here is the um, Marion berry. This is the Marion berry, one of the most popular, developed in Marion County, Oregon, about 1956. Beautiful berry mm -hmm. for yeah, cutting, uh, for uh, fruit. Well, I get to try this one too. For, yes, that's a lovely berry. Very good for cooking, jams, jellies, pies, excellent. Mm -hmm. Lovely berry. Mm -hmm. And it again produces in uh, June, July, and Mm -hmm. Early August. Now the frame that you put them on, um, I noticed is some heavy wire, and maybe you can explain that. Yes, I use the T posts, which are available at most of your local stores uh, in the area, mm -hmm. and I use also on the top rail is a electrical conduit, half inch electrical conduit, and then the wires between them are ordinary clothesline wire. Oh, really? Hmm. So, uh... And you only have uh, one foot, two foot, three foot, maybe, yes. something like that. Yes, about, uh, about five foot. They, you can put them higher, but then you got to pick higher, so mm -hmm. yeah, easier to use it this way. Yeah. Uh, so we have asparagus here, I notice, and uh, I've always had trouble growing asparagus. How do you do it? Well, it's, it's a difficult one to start. Uh, sometimes the plants aren't too great when you get them. Uh, it's just a hit and miss type of thing. But uh, once you get them going, they're pretty hard to kill. <laughs> Good to know. Yes. Except the crabgrass got after mine. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's <laughs> I don't know right. going to win that battle. But um, there again, in raised beds are uh, probably the best way to grow them. Uh, they seem to really like it and produce well. This is a relatively new bed, so it's not uh, as, as high as it should be normally. So, uh, yeah, and they, uh, they take well-drained soil, I know that. Yes, so I, the winter I mix a lot of um, soil, uh, soil and, and peat moss and, and uh, 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 fine gravel, fine uh, sand in, in there, because they like a sandy soil, mm -hmm. well-drained. So uh, there again, raised beds do a good job of that. Well, speaking of raised beds, uh, what, how have you done that? What kind of wood are you using? In oh yes, and, raised and you'll notice too that this is not your rectangle shape, your common rectangle shape either. <laughs> and uh, because I think uh, gardening is more of an art than science, and this proves it here. But yes, uh, it's nice to look at. So tell me about the yes. Uh, so this uh, I use a, a, a full two-inch uh, rough cedar. Uh, I, I paint it with a um, latex-based solid color stain, which gives you probably uh, about two to three years more life on the, on the planks. Mm -hmm. uh, generally with cedar, you're going to get 20 to 30 years anyway, so uh, it's mm -hmm. well worth the extra money to buy cedar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the metal corners are done locally here for me, and uh, uh, they help keep it all together.
So it's not sturdy enough just to drill in and uh, no, together that way. Not advisable. Mm -hmm. No, no, because your 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 soil is going to push it out eventually. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are what two-year-old plants or older? Uh, these are two euros. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And so you've already picked them, presumably, and now they're they're you know this on leaves. I guess you'd call that. And uh, you leave them till they die, and then you cut yes. them off. Is that what happens? Yes. Once these are uh, turn brown, and you can cut them off, but. You must leave uh, before while you're picking your asparagus. You always leave it, and you can generally wait three years with new plants before you start picking. Uh, once they start to get this size, then you just wait and leave these because they have to feed the roots. You don't pick the small ones, so you leave these small ones. Mm -hmm. And is there a male and a female I have to concern myself with? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard that, that some produce berries and some don't or something like that. That could be, could very well be. Mm -hmm. So some so some that come up are really fat, so you can eat those, yes. the little skinny ones you should Leave them, them. yes. Okay, got it. So we have some uh, some funny looking onions here. What's the story <laughs> on these, Bill? Well, these I, I, I gambled uh, and tried a, an experiment here with uh, Walla Walla onions. I planted them in October. Mm -hmm and to see if they would come through the winter and produce in July, but some are okay and some are not, so uh, it's just a gamble. <laughs> well, that's, that's really what gardening's all about, isn't it? That's yeah, right. People think you know everything, but every year is a different challenge. That's and, right. And, uh, yeah. You never know what's going to happen. So. And it always pays to keep trying new things. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's what makes it interesting. Yes. Yeah. So, and over here, but we've got the successful onion patch. That's again. right. That's the this year's planting of uh, Walla Walla sweet onions and Kelsey sweet onions, which are beautiful, yeah. beautiful things. They weigh, Huge. They, yeah, they weigh pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you enter them in the fair at all? No, I have, I have entered before in other years, mm -hmm. but I haven't recently. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And behind us here, I guess, are the uh, peas. And, mm. uh, what kind of peas are you growing here? We, uh, we grow snap peas only. Uh, there's a, lo a lot of varieties of them, and I plant them five times a year. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the third planting right here, and this being the second behind me. Uh, the first is all over, uh, and the fourth planting is down there. I might not get five because of the, the year this was, uh, mm -hmm. short year. Mm -hmm. So, well, we hope for a long fall. Though. Yes, and the peas, the name of the peas are Cascadia and Sugar Lace too. Mm -hmm. And uh, these were sugar snap peas? Uh, uh, snap peas, snap peas. Uh, yeah. Sugar snap is another variety. Okay. Uh, but their snap is their brand name is what they are. And let me see if I get this, I don't know if I've got this straight now. Snap peas uh, get big and you eat them. Eat the whole pod. Eat the whole pod like that. Yes. I don't know if you can see this, but we can find one here for you. Yeah. So you eat the whole pod. You yes. You take the string out down the center. Okay. And you eat the whole pod. Okay. Now, that way you don't waste any shelling peas. You waste the pod. Yeah. That's a good idea because I've been sitting around shelling these. Yes. <laughs> they taste great, but you only do it once. That's right. Um, so. These are snap peas, so how do they differ from sugar snap peas? Well, sugar snap is, is, is the same thing, only it's just a variety of sugar. Mm -hmm. And well, it grows to about six feet high or seven mm -hmm. feet, so uh, not advisable unless you have a ladder. <laughs> <laughs> and like peas. Yeah. Um, well, I grow these ones that stay flat, and that's when you eat them, the whole thing. So what are, how are they different from what you're growing? Well, they, they're uh, another form of a snap pea, only uh, they're a flat variety, mm -hmm. so uh, there's many different varieties, and, and uh, uh, as opposed to a snow pea, they're very, very close to a snow pea. Mm -hmm. So then we got three kinds now, yes. <laughs> snap, snap, and snow. Now I'm thoroughly confused. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's have a look at the tomatoes here. Yes. I've never seen so many flowers on a tomato plant. What yes. are you doing here? <laughs> This particular tomato is one of my favorites. It's called Ildi, and it produces 50, 60, 70, 80 tomatoes on one little stalk 
which of course are multi stalks on the plant, but they're a salad tomato, a little yellow salad tomato, and extremely sweet. Mm. Very I good. Ildi, I L D I. I L D I. Yeah. Yep, that's one of the ones that I grow. Great. Are they late this year? They are somewhat late, yes, because of the uh, late start in the spring, mm -hmm. like everything else. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So, and I've noticed you've got a different kind of scaffolding here that goes quite high. What's the story up here? Yes, up here, uh, this being a, an indeterminate, uh, all of these being indeterminate tomatoes, they, uh, they keep growing until you cut them. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll run this along that first level uh, until it's time to not grow anymore and then cut it off. And then on the top level, when the late blight comes around late September or early September, uh, you cover this over with plastic so as to keep the moisture off. And Any, yet the air can circulate yes. through the tent. Yes. Yeah. That way you, you get your, your crop of tomatoes that you would normally lose. I know. I lost, one year I lost them all to blight. Yes. Because they get on one plant and they just it's travel. The whole the thing. Yeah. Yes, the whole thing goes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there are many varieties there, and there's some, I keep mainly keep my seeds uh, so that I keep them going. Uh, there's a lot you can't buy anymore, like uh, Santa Fe grape. Very good grape tomato. Mm. And keeping your seed, how do you do that? You just take the tomato and you take the seeds out and let them dry and then just put them in a container and they're fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're good. Well, you, well, the tomato's real juicy, so you, you open it up and let that dry? Yes, I put it on parchment paper. Mm -hmm. Just okay. scrape the seeds out. Mm -hmm. While yeah. they're still wet. Yes. And then, then, mm -hmm. then there's then still some gluten or stuff. Yeah, that's stuff right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a bit of a messy job, but it's you worth have it. to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you you know you only need three or four seeds to grow what yes. you're growing here. So. And in um, indeterminate, you must always take these suckers off. Most mm -hmm. people don't. Mm -hmm. uh, they forget that. And the indeterminates, you okay. have to take them off. And those should come out. Yeah. yeah. Well, where was it? One of these up here. Yeah. Yeah. That keeps you busy. Yes. Because they'll shoot out from the bottom as well when you think you're exactly you're growing up here. Yes. So what's this, Bill? Well, that's a volunteer dill. Well, every I garden, have... every garden should have a volunteer, I guess. <laughs> yes, that's right. So Having the heart to cut it down. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, no, it's, it's attractive for a lot of bees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I grow a lot of plants just for the bees. Let them flower. What the heck? That's right? correct. I got the room. Yes. You unfortunately don't have the room, so you have to be quite uh, concise about where you plant and what you do. With exactly. It. Yes. So, and so you've got these um, very um, dwarfed um, apple trees here, I guess they are. Yes. And um, so how old are they and how big These are, are uh, two-year-old plants. Uh, this will be the third year. Uh, they're producing a few apples, but uh, it's time to start pruning, summer pruning, and then getting them shaped to get up these espaliers uh, uh, done properly. It, they can give you a lot of apples in a short small mm -hmm. frame time there. So you're going to espalier, so these ones that stick out, do you cut them off or you, you, you tie them in? Shorten them and then you, uh, you take the other ones down and then you pull and tie where you can down, like this one here will come down mm -hmm. and go over there and then up and so on mm -hmm. all the way through. Mm -hmm. And there again using uh, the uh, electrical conduit and uh, some uh, irrigation fittings you can construct that quite easily and were, <coughs> excuse me were these dwarf plants that you bought yes they're the very dwarf the very smallest very dwarf. yes so they, they six, will only get six high. seven feet high yes mm -hmm. and produce uh, how many apples when you get going quite a few uh, a good well taken plant will will produce 40 to 50 pounds of apples, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a good production on a small tree in a small space. Mm -hmm. And you can have early ones and late ones, so yes. you can have apples for yes. about six months out of the year. As long as you have your um, pollination time approximately mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And uh, this netting here is to keep out keep the out neighbors the, again? Or? The, the birds and, and the ones that want to eat your fruit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You don't have trouble with anything else other than birds? No raccoons, deer? or Oh, I have raccoons come yeah. through here, yes. Yeah. But uh, they don't seem to be too destructive there. They do get destructive if you have corn. Mm -hmm. They love corn, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't grow corn. I like cherries too. Cherries, right? yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go and see what else we can do. Okay. Find. Okay, there's something hiding under this reme here that um, I, I think you can tell us about. <laughs> and what is the reme for and what's growing under there? Well, any of your coal crops, the white butterfly, the cabbage moth, uh, just devastate them unless you cover them and get them uh, protected from it. And uh, as you can see, there's broccoli and cauliflower under here. And uh, it, uh, it's doing quite nicely without any problem from that. So this avoids the use of, say, BTK that some people would Exactly. Use. I don't like to spray anything on, on the uh, uh, vegetables or fruit. But uh, that gives you an idea what, how healthy they can be. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you can see, their heads are starting to form on the broccoli now. Yeah, and it's hot summer weather. This keeps it shaded too. Exactly. Sun, so exactly. It, it acts yeah. as uh, two things because they don't really like uh, real hot weather. They mm -hmm. prefer cooler climate. Mm -hmm. But it, it works quite well for that. And have you grown the kind that you can clip off the main head and the side shoots? Yes, yes, sprouting? it uh, yeah. continues sprouting, yes. Yeah. And you, uh, you have broccoli clear through to the winter time, then. Mm -hmm. then I plant my winter crop later. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your winter broccoli crop? Yes. That, that for when do you eat that? Oh, through the winter mm -hmm. and, and the early spring, and, and it's planted in here. Mm -hmm. So you pull these out and plant, or yes. you plant them? Maybe you plant, start them and then pull them out later? Yes. So you get them going. And then this is covered with plastic to keep the heat in for the winter. Oh, I see. So that uh, it's completely like a little greenhouse in there. Mm -hmm. Very good. And uh, beyond that we have... Um, we have beets beet. and we have cucumbers and more broccoli down there and cauliflower. These are really nice looking uh, beds and uh, you manufacture these in yes. other people's gardens, don't yes, you? Yes, yes, they're, they can be uh, purchased. Uh, and do you, do you uh, sell the, uh, the wood here, the, the rebar here and all the pieces? Uh, I don't sell the base wood, uh, slag lumber or anybody like that have that and, uh, but I do sell the tie strips and the rebar frames mm -hmm. that are all painted and ready to go and uh, uh, mm -hmm. it just depends on the person's application whether they get a side one against a lean-to or uh, uh, an individual framed one. Mm -hmm. And these are all about three feet wide? Yes, so. yes. All my beds are three feet. They're much easier to work with than a four-foot bed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Especially as you get older and leaning over. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> over here we've got a lot of blueberries. Have a look at yes. what kind of blueberries we've got here. Yes, we, uh, I grow uh, an early one called Rika and a late crop called Elliot. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's quite late. And um, I like it because it extends your whole season then through. Oh, they're pretty big, aren't they? They can get some nice size on that Elliot, yes, yes. Where Rika is quite a bit smaller, Barry. Do they take a lot of water? Yes, much water. water, no nitrogen, lots of acid mm -hmm. is what they love. And how do you get, what do you give them for acid? Well, peat moss and uh, sawdust will help take away the nitrogen out of the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, you can buy some compounds that you can add, but I think with natural things it's better to go that way. Hmm. Maybe that's why my blueberries haven't done as well. If there's too much nitrogen in the soil. That's right. It's too close to my compost pile. That's right. Yeah. And you got beans growing up. Yes. Up here. Yes, these are 
probably one of the best beans that I've ever grown. I don't grow any other bean because of you can grow up and get much more productivity out of this than you can of a bunch of uh, bush beans along the ground, mm -hmm. taking up a lot of space. Right. And uh, this is called Fortex Fillet. It's a French... Fortex Fillet? Fillet. Fillet, oh yeah. Yeah, and it's a uh, French heritage heirloom. Wow. And it gets to be about two feet long and it is a very good bean because once it gets mature and fat and you think it's too late, it's still good and tender. Hmm. So I save my own seeds for that also. Yeah, yeah. I find uh, even even though you get a lot of beans on it, they're hard to pick. you got to reach in there and look around. And yes, <laughs> yes. They, they hide and of course you need a ladder to get the top ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's worth it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I see them in the store for a dollar fifty a pound and I think, I would never even grow those little and pick them for that price. So. <laughs> but having your own at home fresh oh, yes. is worth any amount of money. And they freeze beautifully. You just cut them and freeze them. Mm -hmm. And they're beautiful that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Down here we can see a little bit more of the kind of uh, three-foot uh, frame for, for freestanding uh, raised bed down here. So let's, let's see if we can get a shot of that. Okay, so here we have an example of a three-foot wide freestanding raised bed that uh, Bill has got carrots growing in here. Yes, yes. The, uh, there again, I plant five different crops of carrots. As you can see, this is the first one. It's finishing up. Second is here. Third is there. And the fourth will be in here. Mm -hmm. And fifth, if necessary. And can you grow these uh, 12 months out of the year? Yes. That? Yes, these uh, the last crop you plant, you leave it in for the winter, and I always leave the structure on so they can cover it over and keep the heavy rains out of it. And snow. And snow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then you harvest your, your carrots as you need them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're very, very delicious that way. <laughs> Uh, I notice you have rime uh, just uh, going up uh, about a foot high. Uh, what's the purpose of that? Yes, the rime keeps the carrot rust fly from flying in because he flies right near the soil level. Uh, so it's not necessary to completely uncover them or, or enclose them. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you just put it a foot high, that's all that's necessary. And divide it up um, in, in different uh, sections so that he doesn't fly. And this has to be a sandy soil and I guess fairly deep for the kind of carrot. Yes, growing. yes, fairly deep soil, uh, very, very sandy, um, nice loam. Um, anytime you get a, a, a very hard soil, anytime the uh, carrot will contact anything, it'll branch out and go in different directions. So do you, do you grow the short variety mostly in these? It's the uh, Napoli, which is called about an eight to nine inch carrot, mm -hmm. just the perfect size. And, and, and how deep is the raised bed for an eight or nine inch carrot? Then? Uh, I have about 12, 14 inches in this bed, mm -hmm. so that's uh, plenty deep. Mm -hmm. And they're all the same variety? Yes, yes. I've tried quite a few different ones and I found this is the best one. Mm -hmm. And there again, there's some... Uh, this one's all netted up with a different kind of netting. Yes, this is keep that uh, uh, white butterfly out again. Okay. And... Uh, it looks like you might be able to get in right there, too. Yes, they... You never know, they're real smooth. They find a way. Yeah. And in here, there's some cauliflower and some broccoli planted. Mm -hmm. They'll be uh, coming to mature pretty soon and some kale. What kind of kale is that? I've never seen it. That's called the black Tuscan uh, or dinosaur kale. Which is, uh, dinosaur kale? Yes, <laughs> that's what they have a nickname it for it. It does look like a prehistoric plant. Yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, um, I think you have a secret about uh, compost and, uh, and, and, and sand and everything and how you keep it uh, separated. Oh yes, yes. I'd like to show people that. Sure. Compost bin. Let's have a look. So 
So most people might look at this and say, oh, you've got a boat under there, don't you? You go rowing some sometime when you're in your free time, if you have any. Yeah. Um, so what what is this here, anyway? Well, every uh, garden should have one of these, and uh, you're constantly working with your soil, so you need lots of different things. So what I do is I call it a compost bin, uh, aggregate bin. And in there, there's different soils and uh, sea soil, sea soil, and uh, ordinary potting soil, and uh, and bark mulch, and uh, three types of sand, grades of sand, some pebbles, some rocks, some some green rock, and uh, so on, mm -hmm. sawdust, mm -hmm. and uh, it saves you going out every time, running out and getting a yard or so of it, or uh, a bucket or two of it mm -hmm. when you need it. Do you buy it by the large bag then? I buy it by the bulk, uh, yes. I have a small truck and I just oh, bring in what I need and then the rest, the balance goes in here. In the back of the pickup? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Hmm. Yes, it's very useful. Okay. So let's go have a look at the um, greenhouse and see where everything starts. Okay. Wife is busy growing lots of flowers. Yes, she does uh, all the flowers. Yeah. yeah. So here in the greenhouse is just a simple little uh, lean-to greenhouse that you've managed to, uh, to use the space very well. And this is, uh, I guess, uh, where you uh, grow your transplants. Yes, this is the uh, starting structure. Uh, there's a five different levels, and the uh, using the T5 sunblaster. Uh, lights for grow lights mm -hmm. and heat mats for heating because you start mm -hmm. um, your onions start in December mm -hmm. you sow them in December mm -hmm. so you have to get the heat on them the light once they come up they need 14 hours of light a day mm -hmm. all your seedlings do mm -hmm. and this keeps them from getting spindly this light yes. here this is very strong light yes because the uh, this fluorescent lights may not, normal fluorescent lights may not be enough no no uh, you must keep this down within two inches of the top of a seedling. As you can see here, if a seedling was was there, you would have to bring this down just to above there. Mm -hmm. So it's adjustable that you can lower or raise it. Mm -hmm. And then when they get they get too high I just transfer them over to the other side where I got a little more height mm -hmm. in my lights. So you're over to fluorescence here after that. Uh, well, no, that's the that's the sun blaster also. That's a T8. Oh, okay. These are the smallest and the most efficient one, other than that one. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So is this whole place full in the uh, springtime? Yes, you can't move in here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very very efficient. Even more over here. Yes, there's uh, one, two, oh. three, three layers there, or three tiers. It's amazing that you have room to plant all these transplants. Yes, yes, yes. And um, these tomatoes in uh, limbo here? These tomatoes are ones I'm trying to, uh, I got the seed late for, for them, and I'm trying to keep them in the greenhouse so that I can find out what kind of tomato they are. I've, mm -hmm. I've never known this one before, so uh, I'm trying to see it uh, in order to assess what kind of, if it's worth growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so on. So you let it. You try the tomato. Yes, I'll keep them in the greenhouse until they fruit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing we didn't discuss, Bill, is uh, I noticed that everything is just sticky too and clean, and no weeds growing anywhere. And I, I know you probably prepared this for us before we came, but you do have a lot of paving stones here, and that seems to keep the. You don't. You're not walking on any gravel. You're not walking any dirt. So, what was that like to put that in, and how did you do that? Well, this was a, um, a major project. Which my wife and I hauled all the paving stones and laid them all. And, of course, underneath them is the uh, landscape fabric, which prevents any weeds from growing. But they still seem to grow in between the paving stones occasionally. So you just pull them out after it rains. So mm -hmm. it's quite easy. So you put sand down and then the yes, uh, fabric and then 
Do you put grout in between the... Uh, no, no, no. Just just, just a fine sand. Yes. Uh, just uh, swept in and mm -hmm. that keeps them well. Mm -hmm. And the reason for the paving stones is uh, in the winter time there's no grass to muck to get into. You can walk out to the compost bin which is at the back and uh, back and forth and uh, fine and do anything in your garden that you want to do. Uh, the other nice thing about paving stones is, and most people don't realize this, uh, and we come across it simply by accident uh, after putting them in, uh, during the evening, after the sun goes down, everything cools off. Uh, but the sun being out on those paving stones all day, they heat and they heat all night. So your garden grows all night, mm -hmm. especially in raised beds. So that was a plus. Yeah, added benefit because painting stones aren't cheap. So no, they aren't. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> but well worth the investment, uh, I think. So you, um, where the raised beds are, uh, did you excavate any dirt to put them in there and add dirt? No, no. We left the um, some some of the original soil is under each bed, and uh, it was good soil, but clay base. So you. Uh, any time that you go on top of clay base, you should work with your soil and build it and compost, uh, mushroom manure, uh, lots of organic material. And uh, uh, soils generally uh, will take quite a while. It's taken us 10 years, 12 years to build good soil. And um, then you uh, add your uh, sand, depending on what you want, how porous you want your soil to be, and so on. And you had an organic fertilizer, too, that you used. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I use the organic fertilizer because I find that it's far superior to anything that's chemical. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple produced uh, locally. Uh, Integrity Sales have a good one. Uh, Borden's Mercantile have another good one. So uh, uh, that's a... That's a must, and, and uh, one application per plant per growing season is all you need with that. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very good. That's good, because I usually rely on compost, and perhaps that's not, not quite enough for most plants. No, uh, I think compost is good. It depends on what goes into the compost, of course, too. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it won't do everything on its own. You must give it some help. Do you have some uh, information here on the... Uh, yes, we raspberry. talked about the uh, fall gold raspberries earlier, and uh, this is a gentleman, uh, a pamphlet on it, that uh, produced it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. And what is his name? In his name's um, Elwin Mader. He's a uh, Quaker from Pennsylvania. And in um, the back page there, you'll see the... Uh, the, uh, I've highlighted the area where he's talked about the fall gold raspberry. You, you can read that if you like. He crossed a wild berry he found in the Korean mountains, for example, with Taylor red raspberry, later crossing its offspring with the sister of the fall red raspberry. Meter's complicated breeding program ultimately produced what he calls the sweetest raspberry grown. Fall gold. Bearing from July to late October, fall gold survives minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit, producing its large golden fruit on the edge of new team. That sounds like the perfect raspberry for here. It's beautiful. It's a lovely raspberry. And also here is... Uh, you freeze that and uh, eat it all year round. Yes, we generally eat them. We don't freeze them too much. Uh, the red raspberry we freeze. Now, having said that, uh, is that because they're better fresh, or they don't freeze well? Uh, they don't freeze as well as the red raspberry, I find. So uh, we've gone with the meaning that we eat most of those uh, uh, in the autumn and um, uh, freeze the uh, the the telamine, the big red raspberry, because mm -hmm. it freezes well. And this pamphlet here is a. Uh, a rundown on the production and the breeding programs of organs, raspberries, and blackberries. Very informative. Mm. So this is 
this will talk about the Marion berry? It talks about the Marion berry, the young berry, and many, many others that are in there. Young berry, of course, is your first one and your first page, I believe. Mm -hmm. that one? Yeah, what you tasted. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, uh, big black that young berry. Is that him there? That's no, it's a Logan. So there used to be a lot of Logan berries grown here on the peninsula. Yes. And yes. Uh, would the young berry have been a better one for them to grow? Or? The uh, Logan was mainly used for jams, jellies, and wines, basically. And as far as a, a fresh eating berry, it wasn't too popular. More in so far as a breeding program, it became more popular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But. Um, so the young berry is a better eating berry. Yes, yes, and it's crossed with a dewberry, and uh, there again, um, Marion berry, uh, one of the most popular in the Northwest. Uh, and on your last page, you'll find the um, the, the breeding charts of most of your um, berries. That reminds me, when I was over on uh, the other side of the water there. Um, I came across a cascade berry, which was delicious, and I've uh, never seen it um, on this chart or seen it since. Is there a young berry by another name, perhaps? No, it could be. It could be bred later than this information was given out. I'm not familiar with a cascade, but I've heard the name, so it's out there somewhere, and it's, uh, I don't know its origin. So if anybody has one, we'd like to hear about it. <laughs> yes, yes. So you, uh, so how many years has it taken you to get to this point? We built the home in, in 92, 1992, and uh, we started on the garden from the uh, east side about 1993 and uh, finished up uh, about four or five years later in the west side, and um, that was how long it took to do it, and from there it's just been growing. So really, we're looking at four, four or five, six years worth of effort, right? Here. Yes. So that's not re not very long to produce what you've done. No, I no. I lived in a house for ten years before <laughs> I started <laughs> seeing results of any kind. Yes. So yeah, you've been really successful. So how easy is it that you find other people and get them started to uh, do what you've done or something similar? Well, I hope uh, that a lot of people um, take up gardening because we live in one of the best climates in, in, in all of Canada for growing fruits and vegetables, right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can grow all year round, so uh, it, it's far superior. And I hope just people that uh, tend to take it up and, and plant a, a one little bed, that's all they need to start with. Mm -hmm. Then when they catch on, They'll, they'll want to plant more. I think <laughs> when they taste something that <laughs> yes. comes out of the garden, they'll go, Yes. I never realized tomatoes taste like this. Exactly. Because all yeah. through the winter, you buy tomatoes that were grown in a greenhouse, and yes. they're tasteless, really. Yes. So yeah, we're all waiting for our tomatoes this year to harvest. That. Have you started harvesting some tomatoes? Oh, yes. We've been eating tomatoes here from the patio for about a month now. And uh, behind me, you can see them. There's a... Uh, those are the determinate types. These are determinates, yes. To the you do not take the uh, center growth out between the leaf and the stem. And are they always the smaller uh, tomatoes? Not necessarily. Some are larger. This red one here is, uh, is a medium-sized tomato. It's probably the earliest, along with uh, the, the uh, gold nugget. And did you start those from seed? In yes. The yes. When did starting. you start the seed? Oh, well, we started them in uh, February, March, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, then graduated them out, keep them warm, mm -hmm. and... So you have to, uh, so they're in there, and you have to acclimatize them to the outdoors, so how yes. do you, how do you, well, you them at night or something? Yes, you harden them off, and uh, the first nights that are cold, you can take them back into the greenhouse, but uh, then as it gets a little bit better, you can cover them with remay uh, or plastic or something like that or put them in one of your raised beds at night, cover them, open it up in the daytime and then they, uh, they, they get hardened off and then they're ready for planting out in June. Well that's great, I think you beat me and my neighbor for early tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So 
there's, there's a lot to learn here. Yes. Well, have, um, thank you very much for your time and uh, showing us your garden. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. And I hope uh, other people are uh, as, um, as enthusiastic as I am about growing your own vegetables in your own place because um, it's a lot of fun and it's very, fairly, very easy. You know? And uh, you, can make a, you can make a fairly good... Um, very good garden out of it and when you plant uh, your own things and you harvest them and you prepare them in the kitchen you'll find that uh, not only does it taste good but it's a heck of a lot cheaper than buying it in the store so, exactly so, um, so I hope you like this uh, little interview and uh, we hope to do more with similar people who are growing things in the backyard because I really think that's the uh, future of our food supply and it has to pertains to uh, food security issues. So thanks very much for watching.